Wizard with the Whip versus the Lord of the Night, the King of Evil himself, Dracula. To reach his ultimate foe, the vampire hunter must conquer the ever-changing mobile castle filled with demonic minions, Castlevania. There are few series as near and dear to my heart as Castlevania. And I'm not talking just the animated Netflix series, which is about as good as you could possibly hope a video game adaptation to be, but nah, I mean the whole franchise, bottom up. Minus a few entries that we'll talk about later. The series has had a major impact on not only my life, but my career as well. Most people aren't aware of my five or so years as a games journalist and content creator, but some of my earliest videos were on Castlevania. And of course, our ever popular Hellmouth series on this channel comes from me reviewing Castlevania games in October, way back in 2016. Without Castlevania, it is very likely that Bonsai Pop would not exist. You see, there was once a magical time before Morbius, before Twilight, when vampires were actually cool, and before that, there was Castlevania. Arguably the first horror game ever made, and the series that granted the Can Do No Wrong label to a company called Konami, which, after killing, burying, and pissing on the grave of Castlevania for the last 15 or so years, has largely gone tits up and lost all respect from even its most rabid believers. As someone largely influenced by the horror film genre, thanks specifically to an irresponsible uncle of mine, I often smashed his copy of Castlevania into a top loader NES as the perfect addition to my addiction, even though I really sucked at it. See, I was a vampire kid, my dudes. Buffy, Angel, Interview with a Vampire, From Dust Till Dawn, The Lost Boys, that was my jam. I played vampire decks in Magic. I even collected vampire Warhammer figures for a while, but it all started with a simple game on an old console, one with the tightest controls, high difficulty, immaculate theming, and some of the best music to ever grace the ears of anybody with a controller in their hands. Also, there should be no doubt in anybody's mind that Castlevania is a series that was made for an anime adaptation. While it originally took inspiration from the Universal Monsters, it undeniably has a Japanese twist that gives the franchise its very own unique and undeniable flavor. Regardless of the fun factor, the games drip with style from the promotional art to the presentation and especially the music. The fact that Yoshiaki Kawajiri didn't take on a Castlevania adaptation after Symphony of the Night, which out of all the games has by far the most anime aesthetic, is a goddamn tragedy. That being said, I'm not complaining with the way that things eventually worked out. Despite the very sad decline of Konami and the lack of loyalty to one of their greatest creations, when I heard that there was going to be an anime adaptation of Castlevania in 2017, and that it was going to be at least anime inspired, I couldn't help but get my hopes up. But then it dropped and immediately got greenlit for a season two the same day. And I think at that time we all knew that we were in for something not good, but great. Anyway, there's a lot to talk about here from the lore to the games and inevitably the show. I've been waiting years to make this video and in a moment, you're gonna find out why it's coming out now, but I do not wanna delay any further. This is Castlevania. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, Mike here. I'm going to be the voice and face of this video and this channel. We had plans for putting this video out this year in October in Hellmouth like we usually do with you know, horror related stuff, but in a stroke of fortune, our old friends from Figurama Collectors asked if we'd be willing to promote their new Castlevania Symphony of the Night statue. And of all of the statues they've released, this one holds a very special place in my heart. I was looking at it before they even notified us. It is an amazing rendition of Alucard and Richter Belmont, and this is Figurama's very very first venture into the video game sphere. And if you haven't seen their work before, uh, you clearly miss some of our videos, but they are absolutely the best at what they do. We're talking the highest quality, attention to every detail, Easter eggs hidden throughout the entire piece, including in this one, all three of Alucard's forms, Mist, Wolf, and Bat, Dracula's throne room, and my dudes, this isn't a figure like you'd buy at a convention, okay? Figure out statues are, first of all, they're statues. I mean, this thing is going to weigh some poundage. And they are massive. This one is estimated at about three feet tall. So if you are a Castlevania fan, if you are a mega fan, this is your one chance to get a piece of art that represents exactly what you love and something that you will treasure for the rest of your life. Pre-orders begin on May 7th at 10 a.m. Eastern and they sell out super fast, always less than 24 hours, sometimes as quick as just an hour. We've done this many times before and they have always, 
always sold out and this is one of the coolest pieces that they it, like seriously i wanted the sponsorship before they even asked us so if you want this statue set an alarm and get on it before they sell out because they have never remade a limited edition work you're going to use our coupon code that's going to be right here on the screen and then right there it's going to tell you it's going to tell you how much you're going to save with that code seriously the type of opportunity where you're going to purchase something that you're going to keep for the rest of your life they don't come around very often so if you look at this and you say oh man like i want this then you're not going to want to miss out May 7th, 10 a.m. Eastern. Use our code right here at the screen. Set an alarm so you don't forget. Let's get on with the show. Castlevania is, in the end, the story of Dracula. Formerly Matthias Kronkvist, then Vlad Tepesh. The guy changes his name as often as Prince, okay? The canon follows him from his transformation in 1094 all the way through 2035 when he somehow gets reincarnated in Japan. All the while, he's hounded by the church, cult-like offshoots of vampire hunters, his own son, and of course, the infamous Belmont line. The latter being enemies of his own creation, so it's a little hard to feel bad for him. He is, after all, the biggest dick of all time. However, his story is also a tragic one. You could say the man was cursed from the beginning to lose everyone he ever loved. That blows. But does it mean you have to become a genocidal immortal lord of the night and all demon kind? I don't know. Dracula, as he is portrayed throughout the series, is more than a simple vampire or even lord of the vampires. In a very anime way, he exists in a form of his choosing while his true being is an ever-changing amalgamation of dark powers laying in wait within the dark realms of hell to be called upon at his whim. Which is usually right about when he thought you kicked his ass. While Dracula is defeated often, he never truly dies and is constantly resurrected through curses of his own design or, you know, psychotic devil-worshipping cults. Beyond the story of this universe flitting through real-world events like the witch burnings of Europe and both world wars, Castlevania is f***ing mental, my dudes. While the bosses are always highlights, spanning from monsters made out of hundreds of dead corpses or death they self, the moment-to-moment -moment enemy interactions are something to behold. It's like a D&D bestiary plus Japanese yokai compendium anime to kill you. It was one of the earlier series to be censored in the West that wasn't a fighting game like Mortal Kombat. Castlevania was just cool, man. Now, when I played the original Castlevania for the first time, it scared the actual shit out of me. I was probably about six, but you gotta understand at the time, systems like the N60 Fog were cutting edge. A lot of us were still messing around with the NES, Super Nintendo, and the Sega equivalents of those systems. Back then, for the most part, parents didn't understand what a new console generation meant. Why get your kids something new and expensive when they already had a perfectly fine console to play the video games? What is bits? Luckily, both my dad and that irresponsible uncle I mentioned earlier were very big into video games at the time, so I did have access to newer consoles and games, you know, when they weren't playing, which meant I did spend a ton of time with older systems, and while I loved horror movies, I was also a super chicken and would have nightmares for weeks. The original Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Evil Dead were particularly traumatizing as a child, which is partially why I wasn't allowed to watch those movies, which is where that awesome yet irresponsible uncle came in. And the same thing went for games like Castlevania, Blood Rain, Mortal Kombat, you name it. It's weird to think of Castlevania as something that could possibly be scary now, but back then we didn't have anywhere near the capability to replicate reality like we do in this current age. Imagination played a big key and I had a big imagination. And I thought the original Castlevania was scary. When my uncle got Castlevania 64, that shit went up like 10 notches easily. But that's a big jump. Castlevania 1 to 64, that's, that's a lot of games. But I was a kid, man. I didn't know what I was missing, which turned out to be nine games, not uh, 63. And they spread from the NES to the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Game Boy, MSX, TurboGrafx CD, and PlayStation, including the amazing Castlevania Rondo of Blood and one of the best games to ever be released, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. These were pieces of the puzzle I wouldn't be able to touch for another 15 years, but I got my hands on Castlevania where and when I could, including the Game Boy Advance titles like Circle of... You think he's distracting the video, man? Try living with him. Circle of the Moon, which was and still is fantastic. And at this point, I'm sure that viewers of the channel are probably wondering where the show comes into this, and I'm getting to it. It is the glue that holds this video together, but it is also the swan song of a series we will likely never see another release for ever again. So first, I'm going to start with the end. Now, I previously mentioned Castlevania 64, and nostalgia aside, that game sucks. Grainy, obtuse, terrible camera, weird heroes, if it wasn't for the sparse moments of excellent soundtrack, it would be a complete dumpster fire, and it was a perfect sign of things to come. Castlevania was never meant to go 3D. 
Before Castlevania 64 dropped, the series had finally adopted a Metroid-like approach to its game design, which incorporated a leveling and power system, as well as tool advancements, which allowed further exploration through backtracking. While the series was originally a left-to-right level-based platformer with bosses blocking progression, peaking at Rondo of Blood, which, again, amazing game, the advent of Metroidvania brought the series to new heights in Symphony of the Night, the aforementioned Rondo of Bloods direct sequel. But all of that was thrown out when it came to the 3D games. At the time, the industry was desperately trying to snuff 2D gaming out by allocating it specifically to underpowered handhelds, which they thought were for kids. Thankfully, we would still see excellent 2D games through the Nintendo DS years, and some amazing ports and compilations on the PSP as well. But the big console releases were going 3D exclusively, and they were largely disappointing. At least to me, okay, these are my opinions. But hey, maybe you've never played a Castlevania game before. For the most part, they follow the Belmont family through their encounters with Dracula and his mobile fortress, Castlevania. Dracula appears throughout history, bringing a reign of terror with him, and the period's Belmont scion goes to destroy him with the legendary Vampire Killer Whip. The Vampire Killer, my friends, is not only one of the coolest weapons to ever be created, but is also one of the most iconic symbols in gaming history. You see a buff dude with a whip, you know you're looking at Castlevania. However, the latter games in the franchise would see the player taking control of increasingly removed entities, ironically starting with arguably the best game in the series, again, Symphony of the Night. Now, when I was young, Symphony of the Night to me was just a myth. Nobody I knew had it, nobody in my family owned a PlayStation, nobody around me besides myself even knew that the Sega Saturn existed. The only reason I knew that it was a thing at the time was because my neighbor Jared had watched his older brother play through it years before, and the only thing that he could tell me about it was that he played as a vampire, he had a bunch of really cool powers, and there was bosses in the game that were too big to fit on the screen. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like the coolest thing I've ever heard. And he was partially right, this vampire would be Alucard, who is actually a half-vampire spawn of Dracula and a human female. The demon met through fate. Instead of a whip, Alucard uses just about anything else, including his fist, and he was certainly not a Belmont. He was, however, associated with the clan as he had helped Trevor Belmont, Sypha Belnades, and your boy, Grant Dynasty, take down Dracula in Castlevania III over 300 years prior in 1476. The events of Symphony of the Night wouldn't take place until 1797, backed up by tight, exciting gameplay and yet another fantastic score, if not the best one in the entire series. Symphony of the Night was about as good as it gets, but the 3D games, again, would abandon this style and fly far into left field. You see, Richter, who was the Belmont during the events of Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night, would be cursed by the latest and greatest Dracula acolyte, Shaft, within the events of Symphony of the Night, who would proceed to indeed Shaft Damn right. the Belmont bloodline for the rest of history by taking away their ability to use the Vampire Killer, which is the only weapon that can actually kill Dracula. Castlevania 64 would star Reinhard Schneider, an heir to the Belmont clan, and would be more of an action platformer. Unlike the crisp looking and mechanically sound Symphony of the Night, Castlevania 64 would be plagued by stiff, awful controls, lots of in-game fog, and a notoriously jank-ass camera. Lament of Innocence would release next on the PlayStation 2 in 2003 and follow the story of Leon Belmont in 1094. While this was appealing story-wise because it showed obviously the origins of Dracula and the Vampire Killer Whip, as it's the first game chronologically in the timeline, it didn't change the fact that the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay kind of sucked. Besides not feeling like a Castlevania game at all other than the fact that your main character uses a whip, Lament of Innocence is basically long corridors and annoying, unskippable enemy encounters, and it was overall lackluster. In 2005, we would see Curse of Darkness on PS2 and Xbox, and look guys, I, like, we, we should know, we all know by now that Castlevania never had, like, the best voice acting going on. Your words are as empty as your soul. What is a man? But between these two releases, we got some of the memeiest memes. I would have won were it not for his ebony stone. Ebony stone? What's that? If you want to know. Beat me! I'll beat you. To a pump! You promised. Answer me. What is the ebony stone? A stone. Crimson stone? <laughs> Kill you and the night. What? 
Naga Bazed. I see. This will not make sense to you. But Your beloved was killed on false allegations that she was a witch. I know how you feel, and I sympathize truly, but please look past right. That crest! Are you the Devil Forge Master? Are you the Devil Forge Master? Are you truly the Devil Forge Master? I recall there was another Devil Forge Master. Time to die. <laughs> but Curse of Darkness is a sequel to Castlevania 3, following not Trevor or Alucard or even Sypha, but some dude named Hector who has a bone to pick with some dude named Isaac. They're both Devil Forge Masters, and in about an hour in, I was bored out of my mind and very unhappy. Gameplay-wise, Curse of Darkness is tighter than Lament of Innocence, but much better than bad, it's just okay. And story-wise, I found it unengaging. I don't care about Hector, I don't care about Isaac. Trevor Belmont, a name you're going to be hearing a lot in this video, is present in this game, and beautifully corny. But all around, I found playing as a Devil Forge Master kind of lame, and at the time, putting together the pieces of how this game connected to the others was very obtuse. However, while all of this was going on, the handheld side of things was a major bright spot, not just for the franchise, but for the industry as a whole. A slew of awesome titles with amazing gameplay were rolling out on the wreck, but even then, things were still kind of weird. Even in Circle of the Moon, which as I stated before is an excellent game, we're playing as some dude named Nathan Graves. It was also cut out of the canon, which I think is bullshit as it totally fits and there's no reason for it to be cut, and it was given awesome reviews too, but when you got a franchise this big, you're gonna have big egos to go with it and uh, Koji Igarashi wasn't part of the development team on that game uh, and I think he was a little bit butthurt about that so he cut it from a cannon. What are you gonna do? However the follow-up title Harmony of Dissonance would see the player following a Belmont again finally this time in 1748 with Juste Belmont. While the music blows uh, which is pretty typical of the Game Boy Advance it was a decent iteration on the Metroidvanias and has this unique color palette I actually enjoy a lot and it of course fills in some gaps in the lore which is really nice and then shit just got really weird okay aria of sorrow the third gba title while a well-received and all-around really good game takes place in 2035 in japan again we're talking about a series that almost exclusively takes place in the mostly distant past in wallachia which exists in europe and is centered around the belmonts while dracula and the belmonts are here in this title to a certain degree it's just a huge departure from the norm but again it was a good game it was well received so aria of sorrow would have a direct sequel on the ds called dawn of sorrow which won best nintendo ds game of 2005. so in the same year we received curse of darkness to mixed reviews we got a handheld 2D Metroidvania title to critical acclaim. And over the next three years, Castlevania Portrait of Ruin, a sequel to a Sega Genesis only title, Bloodlines, was released to, again, excellent reviews in 2006. Now these games are cool, but they're a little weird. Both follow characters outside of the direct Belmont clan. Bloodlines taking place during World War I and featuring a character named John Morris, who is a Texan of all things and a descendant of Quincy Morris from the actual Bram Stoker novel Dracula. That's right, Quincy Morris happens to be a distant relative of the Belmonts, which is convenient. So that's the Genesis title. Portrait of Ruin on the DS returns us to the Morris family with John's descendant, Jonathan, very original, taking the lead role during the events of World War II. And finally, Castlevania Order of Ecclesia, largely a standalone title taking place not too long after Symphony of the Night, and the only Castlevania game with a sole female protagonist was the final original 2D Castlevania ever released. Order of Ecclesia received good reviews despite taking place in the time period where the Belmonts had all disappeared and it just being a relatively strange game as far as the series goes. So by now, if you're paying attention, you probably notice a couple of things. A, uh, the Castlevania timeline is very confusing, and B, the games didn't come out in any particular order uh, regarding the canon. Castlevania 1 takes place well after Castlevania 3. 2 takes place right after 1. Super Castlevania is a remake. Bloodlines is a side story. Circle of the Moon was removed from the canon. Yada, yada, yada. In fact, if you were to order the games by the timeline, the original Castlevania starring Simon Belmont would be Castlevania 6. By 2009-2010, Konami had begun to falter. They were at one time almost unequivocally the masters of 2D home gaming, but the push for 3D for their classic franchises was weak, and their ability to work with their legacy creators like Koji Igarashi and of course the legendary weirdo himself, Hideo Kojima, was completely falling apart. So we got a reboot. And it was ASS! in my humble opinion. Castlevania Lords of Shadow 1, 2, and Mirrors of Fate 
were f awful. A complete reimagining and reworking of the Castlevania lore with a heavy emphasis on ripping off God of War and a major boner for quick time events. While Lords of Shadow overstayed its welcome, Mirror of Fate was ridiculously short and looked like it took the devs less time to make it than it takes to beat it. While Lords of Shadow reviewed well, at the time, God of War hype and love for its gameplay style was at an all time high. And we're talking classic God of War, not PS4 God of War. When Mirror of Fate dropped on the 3DS, it was very clear that the Lords of Shadow reboot was all we were going to be getting. Scores dropped for a multitude of reasons, and by Lords of Shadow 2 in 2014, review scores were down to 4s and 5s out of 10. It was a bad time, and it was also the end. Much like everything else Konami had left at the time, they pissed it away into pachinko machines. The original timeline of Castlevania hadn't been touched in six years, and the kids had all but forgotten about the Belmonts and their eternal struggle against Dracula. That was until 2017 when it was announced that Castlevania was going to be getting an animated adaptation on Netflix. Now for me, that's what I like to hear. And I grew up with the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, the Mega Man anime, the Mortal Kombat cartoon, the Darkstalkers cartoon, the Street Fighters cartoon, and of course, Donkey Kong the animated series. Look, I know how bad this stuff can get, but it will always, always be better than some live action crap full of CGI. And while my hopes weren't high, I did have hope. And whether it was shit or not, I was gonna watch it. At this point, I spent a lot of time going over the games, my personal history and the history of the franchise, and this is because it's one of my favorite series of all time, uh, but also I think it's important to get context as to how much there was to work with when it came to the animated series, almost a thousand years of in-game history, multiple characters from the Belmont family to choose from, and of course their accompanying adventures. When the show was announced, I immediately assumed that they were going to cover Symphony of the Night, and to my initial disappointment, they didn't. Instead, in a stroke of what turned out to be genius, they decided on Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse. Now, outside of retro gamers and Castlevania mega fans, the third official entry in the series isn't talked about much, but it is a great game. Castlevania 2, which was a direct sequel to the original, was a huge departure from the initial gameplay style. It was also stupidly obtuse, but Castlevania 3 was not only a return to form, but a prequel to the original, which took place in 1691. Taking place in 1476 and starring Simon's ancestor, Trevor Belmont, Castlevania 3 was also the first in the series to add additional player characters, including the future star of the franchise, Dracula's own son, Alucard. It also happens to be the second game canonically and technically the story of the first Belmont to ever defeat Dracula. While Lament of Innocence introduced the creation of the Vampire Killer Whip and Dracula himself, Leon Belmont never actually defeated Dracula. They parted ways with Leon vowing that his family would hunt the knight forever. Check this out. This whip and my kinsmen will destroy you someday. From this day on, the Belmont clan will hunt the knight! It would be 400 years later during the time of Trevor that the Belmonts and Dracula would finally clash along with Sypha Belnades, Alucard, and the star of the animated series, Grant Dynasty. And by that, I mean he was never included. And I know there was like a nod to him in the fourth season, but like, did, come on, nobody, nobody caught that. However, who was included were Hector, and Isaac, the Demon Forge Masters from Curse of Darkness. I have to say though, Isaac was decidedly de-animated in the Netflix series. It's definitely a change for the better, but for a show that calls itself anime, and I'm not here to argue that, we're not getting into that shit, his character redesign was a very odd choice when his base model from Curse of Darkness is like the ultimate mid-2000s edgy anime dude. Now, if you thought that the games were a lot to take in, let me introduce you to the manga. Did I mention that there is American comics too? Now I didn't talk about the Game Boy games because they aren't that great and I don't really care about them, but that said, Christopher Belmont is actually a badass and he defeats Dracula twice, but we don't need to get into the American comics because they're about him, 
but the Curse of Darkness manga explains a lot about its own game and the role of these Devil Forge masters. I believe the art as well was pretty influential to the Netflix series as Dracula and Hector look a lot closer to this incarnation than the actual game itself. However, all said and done, Castlevania 3 is a pretty simplistic game. Taking something from the NES and spinning it into a full-length series would definitely take some doing. The manual itself doesn't even give you much to go off, but thanks to the show, again, being the last piece of real Castlevania that we've had since 2008, you can piece together a few things and create some wiggle room to spin something accurate and additive at the same time. For instance, we know how Alucard's mother died thanks to Symphony of the Night, and how that might have made Dracula go a little berserk, seeing as the reason he became what he is in the first place is thanks to his beloved Elizabetha's untimely demise 400 some odd years before Castlevania 3. So if we go from there, starting the show with a little drama would be a nice touch. And I know that I stated earlier that Castlevania was like fucking metal, okay? And I expected the show to have some of that. What I didn't expect was 90s anime level hyperviolence, a foul mouthed brooding Trevor, and some of the best visual action I'd seen in years. Castlevania is not a show. For children. It is a balls to the wall, blaspheming trip to hell and back, and I literally could not ask for more. Except maybe it being made by Studio Madhouse. Yeah, I wish it was made by Studio Madhouse. But it's fine, okay? It's really good. And I wanna be honest with you, uh, I, I don't really like the character art, okay? This is just me, it's just me, it's just a personal taste, okay? I'm just, I'm like, I don't know, there's something about it that's weird. It's kinda like if you took the Legend of Korra and made it for adults. I want my pretty boy Alucard from the promotional art. That's what I want. That's what I want it to look like. Doesn't look like that. It's fine. It's a good show. The animation is amazing, okay? And just because I don't like one thing doesn't mean that it, it came anywhere near to ruining my enjoyment of the entire piece as it is. It is this... this this show was great. Honestly, never have I personally felt so represented by a piece of television. The first episode mm, is genius. Showing Dracula's courtship with Lisa, how while an evil lord of darkness, he also devoted himself to science and the pursuit of knowledge, how he has a softer side to him than we ever see in any of the games. Showing the evil and ignorance of the church and their misguided faith as they not only burn Lisa at the stake for practicing medicine, but when they're absolutely ripped to shreds when Dracula makes good on his promise for revenge. It is clear from the get-go that this is not a one-sided good guy versus bad guy story, okay? There's complexity to the politics within Wallachia, depth of character to Dracula. Meanwhile, Trevor and the rest of the population are just caught up in this shit. Speaking of Trevor, in the game, he's just another Belmont. As the ancestor of the legendary Simon, he was seen as just another hero in the games. However, the show fleshes out a little lore regarding the Belmont family and what had gone on in the 400 years since Leon swore them to demon hunting. Not only that, but it ties in beautiful with the blatant corruption of the church that we see on display in episode one. Now, when Trevor was a child, rumors were spread that his family, instead of being advanced vampire hunters, were actually practicing black magic, which in turn attracted evil to them. Naturally, they were excommunicated by the church they swore allegiance to, hunted down, likely burned at the stake, and their home was destroyed. At the time of the show, Trevor is the last surviving Belmont, a man who has lived his entire life on the run from a very young age. He's not exactly gung-ho about stopping evil, instead he has a pretty blatant fuck you attitude, and deservedly so. Ironically, he and Dracula actually have more in common than he and the church. Again, this is not a show for kids, and it's not just because of the gratuitous violence, it's because there's actual depth to the story. The creators knew what they were doing, they knew they had only four episodes to do it, and they killed it. They totally knocked it out of the park. I'd also like to give the voice actors a hand here, as they did a fantastic job, top down. And it isn't just Dracula that has some depth, okay? Despite Trevor's genuinely nasty disposition, by episode two we see him save somebody out of compulsion. An old man who belongs to the Cordry Speakers, who are nomadic mages, who are kind of this universe's version of the Romani, which actually makes sense because Wallachia was actually a real territory that existed in what is now modern day Romania. It was also situated on the southern border of Transylvania. Also judging by the way history has treated the Romani, it's no wonder the church is blaming the speakers for the nightly demon attacks the town has been suffering, even though they are just trying to offer medical aid to the citizens. You see, it all, it all comes together. After being taken Taken in briefly by the Cordry, Trevor is yet again compelled to find the missing member of their clan in order to get them out of town before it's totally destroyed. And of course, it happens to be Sifa Belnades, stuck in stone, 
just like in the game. Well, pretty close anyway. Now, Sifa is a super understated character in the games, but her and Trevor canonically end up, you know, furthering the bloodline. I mean, if you couldn't tell that was happening in the latter seasons, I don't know what to tell you, but adding her aptitude for magic to the genetic mix of the Belmonts sent them into OP land real hard. Other ancestors from her bloodline would show up in multiple games taking place in the future as well, wielding magics as their main form of offense. Mavria Renard is a good example of this and plays a role in both Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night. Anyway, the whole reason that Sifa is stuck down in the dungeon in the first place is because she's looking for the legendary sleeper, which is something Trevor calls bullshit on, beginning a tumultuous relationship between the two. While well, Sifa is altruistic almost to a fault, in her words, Trevor, he's rude. However, there's bigger problems at hand, namely the church is planning to execute all the speakers for, you guessed it, practicing black magic. And of course this is going to be done to stop the demon raids that they're causing, right? Trevor tries to convince them to leave, but they basically tell him he's a defeated little baby and that the time to stand up is now, otherwise humans deserve to be eradicated by Dracula. And this is where we see a major change in Trevor. Something about getting called out for being a big loser really gets him going and he decides to take up his arms against the inevitable injustice carried out by the town's bishop. This is the man responsible for burning Lisa Tepish at the stake and is a complete looney tune. In episode 3, we see him in his church surrounded by demons, right? And he remarks that you cannot enter the house of God. And then, seriously, this is like the most metal shit, the demon replies, God is not here. This is an empty box. It's amazing. They proceed to completely break him down before they rip him to shreds. I was already sold at this point, but the writing, oh my god, this is like, this is like the best shit. Which I suppose shouldn't be surprising considering the first three seasons were written by Warren Ellis, who is arguably one of the better comic book writers out there, but he also had, uh, you know, you know, like one of those Me Too dudes, so uh, it's a mixed bag. The demons attack, the town fights back against the hordes, and during which the ground falls apart, revealing a giant cavern filled with clockwork mechanisms and advanced machinery. At the bottom of this pit lies a coffin, and out of it rises the man himself, Alucard, who isn't exactly hype to be looking into the eyes of a vampire hunter. Again, very much like the game, Trevor and Alucard come to blows only to form an alliance. He shouldn't die. Yes, fuck you. And one thing I noticed here uh, was the emphasis on how long Alucard was sleeping, which was just about a year. This attention to detail given the death of his mother and Dracula's plans to destroy Wallachia and the rest of the world was perfectly executed not to mess up the canon. Just as it was inferred through Symphony of the Night, Alucard tried to stop Dracula from releasing his armies and was wounded. The reason that he was down here in this pit was because he locked himself away before the events of Castlevania 3 in order to recover. And this is the end of season one. Like I said, is basically perfection. So much so that again, season two was green lit day one. However, it was going to have to be bigger and better. And for the most part, it was. Season two would see the introduction of three additional main characters within Dracula's council, Hector, Isaac, and Carmilla. And thanks to the lore provided in Curse of Darkness and its accompanying manga, it makes sense that the Devil Forge Masters would be here and active at this time. Remember, Curse of Darkness is a direct sequel to Castlevania 3, even though they were made like, the, I don't know, like 15 years apart, something like that. But if you're going to expand the story of Dracula's first true attack on humanity, then this is certainly the way to do it. While I'm not a fan of these characters, especially Hector's stupid fucking haircut, their inclusion was really well done, and they certainly added a dualistic human take on the oncoming war, right? Isaac is completely broken and ready for the death of all human life. So naturally, he is totally loyal to Dracula. Hector is a little bit of a soft guy, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he, he signed up to kill all humans or something like that, but you know, he, he loves animals. And Dracula at this point, he is just breaking. He is so tired of all this shit. And he just wants to kill all the humans and be done with it. However, the idea, that doesn't really sit well with the other vampires on his war council, seeing as they need to eat something for, you know, like eternity. And this, of course, is where Carmilla steps in. Now, Carmilla is an absolute favorite of mine, not just in the show, but in the games. In Simon's Quest, she's one of the main three bosses, and the one who drops the magic cross, which is the only way to get into Castlevania. She's also the boss of Stage 4 in Rondo of Blood, which is the first time she actually shows her true form. The sexy anime lady riding a skull, it shoots tears of blood, and in Circle of the Moon, Carmilla is the one who revives Dracula, setting the entire story of that game in motion. Her character was inspired by the Irish vampire 
vampire horror novel, Carmilla, which actually came out 26 years before Bram Stoker's Dracula, and even makes an appearance in Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust. But whatever the case, it seems that when Dracula's away, Carmilla comes out to play, and it's always a good time. Now in the show, she becomes another antagonist with motivations of her own, and seeing that Hector's convictions are far less solid than Isaac's, she of course manipulates him to work for her instead. She can tell that Dracula is losing his fucking marbles, and having a devil forge master capable of creating an army just for her when she needs to stage a coup, that's pretty, it's a pretty good deal. Meanwhile, the hero trio are prepping for the final fight, they've entered the Belmont archives, which is just full of easter eggs, and is searching for a way to destroy Dracula. And Trevor is finally reunited with the vampire killer. Which now that I've said that word like 10 times, I'm realizing the name is kind of on the nose. Some other highlights of the season include seeing Castlevania itself move. I mean, when this thing appears, it's like a small atom bomb going off. It's totally badass. In, in the same episode that that happens, Carmilla's tirade about how self-indulgent and pathetic the men in her life are is fucking priceless. And of course, the action, when it does happen, is top-notch. Again, like I said, the, you know, being compared to, you know, Avatar Ledge of the Korra is not a bad thing. The animation is extremely fluid, and there are moves that these guys do that are the type of thing that I would actually like to see done more in anime. Godbrand was also a decent character and his death was delightful, seeing Isaac in action was shocking to say the least, and the humor in the season is also pretty spot on and a much needed source of levity. It's nice to see something like Castlevania not taking itself too seriously. I mean, remember, this is a franchise that brought us some of the most epic game dialogue in history. And of course, the climactic battle with Dracula, the savagery, the sadness, the drama, it was all very well done. And with the last episode of season two, being dedicated to wrapping things up, it seemed at the time, especially to those of us who knew the stories of the games, the show was over, right? The story of Castlevania 3 had been told. However, we got two more seasons, dude, and that is when shit got wacky. And not in a bad way, like I said before, I'm not a fan of Curse of Darkness or Hector and his stupid fucking haircut. So what the team decided to do with the next two seasons, in my eyes, was really good, even if it messed with the canon. Whether we see another Castlevania game ever again is questionable, but personally, I would be fine with cutting out Curse of Darkness entirely and sticking to what the anime did instead, if that's, you know, gonna have anything to do with the canon. And speaking of which, since there's nothing canon left to speak about, I'd like to point out one last weird thing, which was the inclusion of Saint Germain. Okay, this guy is a strange time-traveling weirdo whose only canonical appearance was again in Curse of Darkness. This shitty fucking Xbox PS2 game. Like, like these guys, I don't understand. Uh, also, this is Hector. This is Hector in the game, right? Like, that's not, that's not what Hector looks like. But still, like, his only inclusion was in this game. He's super weirdo. I, it, it's really strange that they chose so many characters from Curse of Darkness, this game sucks. But Saint Germain, of course, uh, appeared in the notoriously shit Castlevania fighting game uh, called Judgment, and in one of the Pachinko games, and neither of them are canon at all. However, his role in the series is really well done, and honestly, I think season three and four proved that there is still meat in this universe to explore. The Japanese vampires, this, this time travel stuff, Carmilla herself, or even the other vampiresses that were introduced. There's a lot that can be done within the canon of Castlevania, and Konami is leaving money on the table. You are leaving money on the table. Video games have entered a new phase where it doesn't really matter if things are in 3D or not anymore. The quality of the game is not dictated by its dimensional space. We can see through the success of Metroid Dread, the Ori series, and about a million others that the Metroid genre is alive and well. Even Koji Igarashi made a solid new game with Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. I mean, it's no Castlevania, but the demand is out there. The last two seasons of the animated show demonstrates that it can be easily done without some fucking shit reboot. What I can say is that by far, the Castlevania animated series is the best video game adaptation to ever be made. And I say that with confidence. There has been some pretty solid attempts, specifically with fighting game franchises like Street Fighter and Dark Soccer's. And of course, I'm talking about the movies and the OVAs, but Castlevania is long, incredibly consistent, and took the full on risk of not only being a cartoon, but also being rated for adults. And guess what? 
it paid off because that's the kind of sh we want. It can pay off again. Other games can be adapted this way. We shouldn't have to settle for kids movies or Mario with Chris Pratt and Seth Rogen or Jim Carrey and Sonic, especially not Angry Birds. Oh my God. And it's not just me, okay? Castlevania is one of the highest rated shows to ever hit Netflix. And they've had a lot of hits. This right here is the kind of content that we should expect. This is the kind of content worth paying a subscription for. So one last note, okay two, Netflix is ass. We, we know this. They're cutting back hard on their animated series, they keep upping their prices, and now they're talking about putting ads on their shows and have not been clear as to how exactly that's going to work. That sucks, but they're a nasty greedy corporation like all the rest of them, so I guess I'm not surprised, neither should you be. However, in 2021, they announced that a new Castlevania series was being produced, and one that centered around Richter Belmont and Maria Renard, i.e. the protagonists of Rondo of Blood and the supporting characters for Symphony of the night. And yeah, there's a lawsuit going on because Adi Shankar, the edgiest edge f whoever f and writer producer for the first series wasn't invited, but assuming this show goes down, it is something major to look forward to for the future. Another thing to look forward to in the future is us doing a video completely dedicated to the anime. And of course that will be out in Hellmouth this October 2022. And until then, it's very likely that you have some games that I mentioned here that you could play. Most of the Castlevania games are now on Nintendo Switch, including some that prior to now were very difficult to get your hands on. So I recommend checking them out. And with that, thank you everybody for watching our video. Don't forget about this amazing statue from Figurama collectors like, I'm thinking about buying it. I know I shouldn't, but I'm thinking about it because it's fucking awesome. Again, pre-orders begin at May 7th at 10 a.m. And if you are not on the ball, you are going to miss your chance. Okay, there's something to think about. Don't forget to use our coupon code right here. It's going to be good. It's a good deal. I would like to thank our high tier patron of the week, Foss Kreloff, and our lucky patron of the week, Linoleum. I hope that's a NoFX reference. If so, very cool. We will be back very soon. I know you guys have been waiting for Cross Game. It's coming, I swear. And uh, get hyped for some Yu Yu Hakusho in the future as well. My name is Mike. This is Bonsai Pop. This was Castlevania. Finally, so happy to be doing this one. And I will see you next time. Goodbye.